Hey guys, welcome back to the next video in this channel. Today we have a small video, short video, just a quick little, you know, theory information that I think is going to be useful for you. As you can see, we still don't have the contraption for the camera, so that's why I'm looking that way, but I'm going to be looking this way, so the microphone... So I think we should have audio now. There we go. So I want to talk about the difference between game assets and cinematic assets. We've already done some game assets. We've already done some cinematic assets. But is there really a difference between the two? Like, do you really change a lot of things when you're working with one or the other? And the answer is yes. There are some specific nuances that uh, cinematic and game assets have. However, I want to talk about the future of 3D because nowadays we're living in an age where technology is advancing super, super fast and uh, we're going to get to a point where the difference between one and the other is going to be negligible. So, uh, as you can see here, this is the, um, what's it, the Unreal Engine uh, site, Unreal Engine, as some of you guys know, is the engine that I use the most when I'm doing some sort of uh, game uh, assets and stuff. And the Unreal Engine in the last couple of years has been pushing for 3D to be used in real-time technologies for film, for TV, for uh, like live broadcasting. Like there's a lot of things that they're using Unreal Engine for now. Merchandising, uh, product placement, like there's a, there's a lot of very, very cool stuff. And I just want to talk about the main differences about uh, games and the cinematic assets. So one of the first things that uh, you're going to see is definitely poly count. Okay. So poly count in a mesh. Uh, games need to perform at 60 frames per second, 30 frames per second, per second, depending on the element. And one of the problems with games, it's their real time rendering. They are rendering in real time. So the lights, the shadows, the particles, everything is happening in the exact same moment. When you press a button, the character is going to animate in that exact moment. So that means that we have some constraints. And the main constraints that we have in the game assets are poly count, texture resolution, amount of particle effects, um, draw distance, for instance, like how far you can see into the uh, into the environment, and all of these things play an important role. Now, there's a lot of um, I would say outdated techniques nowadays where they would go like a really, 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 really low poly on characters or on, or on assets. That's something that we used to take uh, or need to take into account needed to take into account quite a bit before when we were in the PS2 era, 360, Xbox 360, um, when, when the consoles that we were using were not as powerful as what we have today, Polycon was a really, really important thing. So you can take a look, for instance, at Super Mario 64. And if you take a look at, at Mario, the Polycon for Mario, I think he was about like 700, 800 polygons. So he was really, really, really low. Uh, nowadays, we can go, like a character can have 2,000 polygons, 5,000 polygons, 20,000 polygons. Of course, you need to be careful about what kind of game you're playing. I've mentioned this before. If you're playing a game, let's say like a Total War, where there's going to be a lot of units at the same time on screen, then of course the, the characters can't have 20,000 triangles each because you're going to have millions of polygons and it's going to be very difficult for the computer and the consoles to render. Uh, so in these cases, then, yeah, the polygons probably going to be limited to 5K, 10K, 15K, depending on how big the character is. However, if you're playing a game such as, as God of War, for instance, where more often than not, you're only going to have a couple of characters on screen, maybe just Kratos and like a boss or a couple of monsters, then the characters can be 100k, 200k, and you're going to be just fine because there's not a lot of things going on at the exact same moment, okay? Uh, now, you also need to take into consideration what platform you're developing for. It's not the same to do a game for a phone, for instance, than to do a game for, uh, let's say, uh, PS5, right? Uh, for instance, right now I'm playing this game called A Dragalia Lost by Nintendo and Psy Games. It's a, it's a gacha game, you know. And uh, it has these very cute, like, chibi characters, and they're super, super low poly. Like, if you see the models, they're probably close to what you would see in Super Mario 64. That doesn't mean that you have to do that. I've seen uh, games like, uh, which was the, the latest one? Marble. There was a new Marble game, a gacha game as well. Uh, I think it's this one, Future Revolution. And, and the assets there are not bad. I would say they're probably like 10K, 15K triangles. So that's, that's one of the first things. The second thing is texture resolution, and that's where like UDIMS come into place. For instance, if we take a look at UDIMS, we know because we did the exercise with the um, what was it? Was it the lamp that we did UDIMS? I think it was the lamp, right? So if you haven't, if you don't know about UDIMS, I strongly re uh, recommend that you go back and check our uh, cinematic asset uh, series with the with the snake uh, oil lamp. 
And uh, with this kind of guys, when you're gonna have like a super big character on screen or you want the character to have like a very intense close up, you wanna make sure that the texture holds uh, all the way until the, the like very close shots, right? So this will mean that you're gonna use a lot of texture space. Now, remember, usually, let's take a look, our calculator right here, a 4K texture, a, a target 4K texture is about 50 megabytes. And we know that we need at least four textures, right? Uh, color, normal, um, a specular and roughness. Those four are gonna give us a very nice result. So if you have a character with one set of 4K textures, you're gonna have 200 megabytes of information. If that character has, let's say 12 UDEMs, you're gonna have 2.4 gigabytes of information. So that's a lot of information. Imagine trying to cramp that information into a disc, even if it's a Blu-ray disc, like a double layer Blu-ray disc that only has like, I think 16 gigabytes of space, you're not gonna be able to fit all of the textures for your game on that specific place. So that's one of the reasons why uh, um, why games need to like really crunch their textures down and optimize them as much as possible so that the size of textures don't go super big. There's one very famous case about uh, right now, it's um, uh, uh, Call of Duty Warzone. And the size of, of the thing for PC is super, super big. I think, what is it? It's 40 gigabytes at least. I've downloaded it because I played it with my brother and it's uh, it's about 90 gigabytes really when you download like every single thing and the cool textures and stuff. So unfortunately nowadays the bottleneck is texture. So you need to be very mindful of what kind of textures you're gonna have. And finally, of course, is performance. So as I've mentioned before, in games you need to run at 60 frames or at least 30 frames per second. So that means that you can't you can't calculate every single thing. The newest technology, and I'd say newest because it's not relatively new, but uh, or it's not super new, but it's new to the game industry, is the RTX, right? So ray tracing is something that has existed in, in 3D for a long time, a really, really long time. However, now, due again to the evolution of technology, we have the option to have ray tracing in real time. And what ray tracing does, it, it pretty much uh, analyzes how the light is actually bouncing on the scene, how it's reflecting, how it's uh, bending on on like um, transmissive ob objects, and you're gonna get like a super, super, super cool thing. By the way, if you're curious about RTX, the newest course that we're preparing, which we'll be releasing very soon, and also a small surprise about that tomorrow, um, we'll be covering RTX. You don't need to have an RTX card to use RTX in Marmoset, and we're gonna be explaining how that works. So yeah, RTX, really cool thing. We're gonna get some very, very nice illumination things but it's gonna be expensive so um some of you probably all of you saw the movie frozen right and some of you might remember the scene about the the frozen in the frozen movie about the castle when when elsa goes all let it go and, and she builds her amazing ice castle right well the thing is the materials used for this thing and i read an interview several years ago where that, that, that talked about this it said that one frame of the scene took about 24 hours to render one frame and the sequence lasted for a couple of minutes so Imagine if we had to render that on my computer, it would take forever. It would take years, years to get like, it would be just one month for one second. If I need 60 seconds, that's 60 months. And <laughs> my whole life is wasted just rendering for this thing. So that's the problem with uh, with movies. And that's why uh, movies and games are are still gonna be a little bit, uh, a, a couple of ways apart, right? Because sometimes for movies, you're gonna have to do something that's really, really, really complex. The lighting scenario is gonna be very complex. The material setup is gonna be very complex and you're not gonna be able to render it in real time. That means that you're gonna have to use traditional rendering like Arnold B-Ray Renderman and it's going to take a long time. You're going to be using a render farm. So um, render times due to textures and due to material setup will get you uh, a very, very long uh, render time, but it will also give you a an amazing result, like, like physically perfect result. Uh, and finally, that doesn't mean that you can't have like cinematic things or, or cinematic productions or, or TV productions in a, in, a, in a nicer word. There's this, um, there's this series called Marvelous... Is it the series, Marvelous? Is this the, no, it's not the one. What's the name of this series? Well, if you can think about like any like kid series, like Paw Patrol, right? Probably everyone has heard about Paw Patrol. Uh, they usually use a very cinematic approach to the assets because assets are gonna be soft, they're gonna have subdivision, they're gonna have maybe a little bit of fur here and there, materials are gonna be rendering. So the rendering is not gonna be as expensive as the Disney renders, but it's not gonna be as cheap as the game render. So this is like an in-between. And that's why I wanted to to um, kind of like uh, introduce to you guys the, the, the fact that sometimes you're gonna have productions or you're gonna have to be building assets that will work both ways. Like this thing right here, like this megaphone, right? I can easily transform this megaphone into a game asset or a cinematic asset and the thing that's going to tell me what that becomes is textures poly count and render time depending on how much i want to i want to uh, use now 
the big question, the golden question, which industry is better? Where am I going to make more money? Where are there more jobs? And the answer is, it depends. In certain places, for instance, here in Mexico, we don't have a lot of uh, game uh, development. We have more uh, like a marketing, we have more uh, film development, we have more special effects. So if a student here in Mexico would ask me, hey, how should I focus if I want to stay here in Mexico? I would say probably into the cinematic, high poly, like a uh, production pipeline. If they say, no, I want to travel to United States, to Canada, to other places in Asia, for instance, uh, Singapore, I think it has a lot of games, Korea, uh, Japan, of course. So if you, if you don't mind going to the industries where the big video games are, then learning the proper pipeline, pipeline for video games is going to be the best tool. But you already know this. It's not about the tool. It's about your skills as an artist. It's how you use the tool, right? Because we know the tools are going to be evolving and technology is going to be evolving. I want to talk very quickly about Nanite. Nanite is one of the newest technologies from Unreal. I think I've mentioned it before in one of the channels. Uh, but it's amazing, guys. It's amazing. Nanite, it's pretty much, you're going to be bringing your high poly from ZBrush, like whatever you have sculpted, directly into Unreal Engine. I've tried it. I've uh, tested it with my 1080 GP, uh, GPU and it works wonders. It's amazing. It's still an experimental phase. It's not uh, ready for release, uh, but it's, it's, it's just amazing. It's a great, great technology. And this means that you as an artist need to have the skill to be able to model and sculpt this sort of thing so that you can utilize this, this technology because otherwise, I mean, you're not going to be using Nanite to render a cube, right? It will be pointless. But if you're really, really good, then the technology is going to help you achieve great things. It doesn't matter if it's for games or for film you're going to be able to do it. So that's it for today, guys. I'll see you back tomorrow. Small, uh, small big surprise about our course, about our Marmoset course. So uh, stay in touch. Make sure to leave a like. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to leave a comment. We are, we're still looking at all the comments. There's one about notes inside of Maya, which I really want to do. So we'll probably talk about that next week. Uh, but let us know what else you want to talk about. Let us know what else you, you might want to uh, see inside of Maya, Substance, ZBrush, um, even a little bit of Marmoset here and there. That's going to be fine. And uh, yeah, that's it, guys. I'll see you back tomorrow. Bye-bye.